This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together and ask his guidance and direction on our study. Our Father, we are so grateful that we can come together to have the light of your word illuminate our thinking, that it is only in your light that we see light, and it is only when we understand reality as you have created it that we can be properly conformed to reality and look at life as it is and make wise decisions and that we can live a life in a way that honors and glorifies you. Now, Father, as we study your word today and we continue to uh, understand the gospel, understand what you have done for us in giving us salvation, which is the, which is the core of the good news that we announce and proclaim, Father, we pray that you would help us to understand these things, these passages, and we can have a clearer understanding of what you've done for us, that it might motivate us to live more for you and to pursue our own spiritual growth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 10. We will only be there for a short time, but uh, you might as well go there to begin with. We're answering the question, is the resurrection part of the gospel message? And the answer to that is yes, it is part of the gospel message. It is how we see Jesus Christ proclaimed by the apostles in the book of Acts and throughout other passages in the New Testament. The proclamation of the gospel, or when you're in a position when you are witnessing to someone, uh, entails the communication of certain pieces of information. Sometimes we have a short time, sometimes we have a long time. But the way in which the gospel is presented in the scripture is that Jesus is presented as the Son of God. He's presented as divine. He is presented as the risen Savior. Now that may or may not entail uh, going into those doctrines in a certain amount of depth, depending on the age of the person, depending on their background, other factors that we have, uh, that we have studied. But there are some today, as I've pointed out, who are saying that not just the message must entail the resurrection of Christ, but if you don't believe as a separate proposition... In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when you first believed, then you weren't saved. Because the resurrection is part of what one has to believe. Now, this gets a little dicey for some people because, of course, we're believing in a risen Savior. And when you are four or five or six years old as a young child, you don't understand a lot of the uh, intricacies and the abstractions that can be related to understanding these things. You may not fully comprehend death, and certainly you don't really understand resurrection. But I think there, if you are presented with a living, risen, divine Savior, then when you're trusting Him, that's what you're trusting in. When you get older, and you may have your thinking shaped and twisted by misunderstandings of Christianity, cult, cults that have taught various things, uh, false views of Jesus, then a person with that sort of thinking needs to have it corrected so they understand the who of who Jesus is as well as the what, because the two ultimately are in, inseparable. 
So it may be important that when you are witnessing to someone who is a little older, someone coming out of certain uh, religious backgrounds, whether whether it's Hindu Hinduism, whether it's Roman Catholicism, whether it's Mormonism, that the understanding of Jesus as the unique, divine, eternally divine Son of God is an important point to make, as well as the resurrection that he had victory over death. And so those things need to be addressed. Now, passage, some, as I said, some people have said recently, and we've come into this issue because of some things that were addressed at the conference back in March, that you have to not only present Christ as a risen Savior, but to be saved you have to uh, understand that in an analyzed way and believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, two passages that are used to support that are 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, which we looked at, and Romans 10, 9 and 10. And so we start with just a reminder of these two, this, these two verses where Paul says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness... And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And as I've pointed out, at first glance, if you think of saved as getting eternal life as a synonym for justification or regeneration, then it seems that this passage is saying you not only have to confess publicly that Jesus is Lord, but you must also believe that he was raised from the dead or you're not saved. But if Paul means something by the word saved other than to be justified or regenerated, then it, this verse really means something else. And what we get into a problem here is in the 20th century American evangelical environment, the word saved has come to mean a technical term for moving from spiritual death to spiritual life, from being unrighteous to righteous, from being uh, dead in your sins to being alive in Christ or regenerate. However, that is not how this word group is really used in the scriptures. And we've talked about that in the past few weeks, and I'm going to deal with it a little more next time to show you this. But you have passages such as Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that talk about the fact that we have been justified, so we will be saved. Have been justified is a past tense concept. That we will be saved is future, so we can be justified and not saved. Because he's talking about saved in a completed or final sense in terms of that face to final face-to-face reality before the Lord. Not in terms of that initial uh, experience of becoming born again, regenerate, or justified. So we have to understand that there are these distinctions, and often we talk about the fact that when we trust Christ as Savior, we are saved from the penalty of sin. As we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are being saved from the power of sin. And then when we die physically and we're absent from the body face to face with the Lord, we are saved from the presence of sin. So whenever you see that word saved or salvation in the Bible, you need to say, okay, is this talking about phase one, phase two, or phase three? In the epistle to the Romans, Paul never uses the word saved as a synonym for justified. He either uses it as a synonym for phase three, glorification, or as a summary of the whole process ending up with our being face-to-face with the Lord in heaven. And so we have been addressing these particular, uh, these particular questions, and we're trying to, we're d- deciding just these two questions, there we go, uh, what we should communicate in the gospel presentation, and what must be, be believed. Do we have to believe in the substitutionary death of Christ for our sins? I believe, yes, we do. Do we have to believe in the resurrection in an analyzed way? Not necessarily, because a two-year-old, a three-year-old, and I've seen two-year-olds. I had a a friend of mine one time who constantly taught uh, good news clubs for Child Evangelism Fellowship, took a little two-year-old with her. She was late twos, 
not quite three yet. And every day at the end of her little Bible class with her, with, with these neighborhood kids, uh, she would ask them if any one of those kids was ready to trust Jesus as their Savior. And one day she got in the car and piled all of her teaching materials back in the car. Her little two-plus little daughter said, Mommy, how come you never ask me if I want to believe that Jesus died for me? You never know when they're ready. And they can be ready a lot earlier than some of us think they can. And so that's just one example. But we believe Jesus died on the cross, but at two or three or four or six or eight, resurrection is still a little abstract. So I would say we... What I'm going to show is that resurrection isn't part of what we must believe, but we can't deny it. We can't be an older individual and say, I'm believing in a Jesus who didn't, raise, didn't rise from the dead. I'm believing in a Jesus who wasn't God. Because a Jesus who wasn't God and who didn't rise from the dead isn't the Jesus who saved you. So then you've got the wrong who. We have to understand we're believing in the Jesus who died and rose from the dead for our sins, the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of Mormonism, not the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who is not God, or the Jesus of uh, the Hindus, who's just another uh, avatar. We are believing in the Jesus who is the Messiah of Israel, the greater son of David, the uh, one for whom and to whom all the prophets pointed. And so we have to draw this little distinction between what's clearly understood or analyzed and what is just sort of vaguely understood by the presentation uh, of the gospel. Now, as we got into this last time, as we got into this last time, we began to look at Romans chapter 9 through 11. I pointed out that as we go into our study of Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, 10, 9, and 10, rather, we have to understand the context. And the context is this epistle to the Romans. And the epistle to the Romans deals with the topic of how is a person justified in chapters 3, 4, and 5. That is, how do you get eternal life? That is, how do you move from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive? How do you move from being uh, dead in Adam to being alive in Christ? How are you born again? And that happens by faith alone in Christ alone. But then starting in chapter 6 through chapter 8, the Apostle Paul shifts to now that you are justified, how does a justified person live? How are we to live in this new life that we have in Christ? We call that sanctification, experiential, or progressive sanctification, or some other terms that are used for it. It is the growth that we have in our, in our spiritual life. And at the conclusion of chapter, uh, chapter 8, Paul makes a statement that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And so someone might say, well, what about the Jews? It seems like they've been separated from the love of God. And so in chapters uh, 9, 10, 11, the focus is on defending or explaining God's, vindicating God's righteousness in relationship uh, to Israel. And I used the term last week, corporate Israel. The focus here is not on Jews individually, but on the Jewish people as a corporate group. And let me say a couple of things about that and what Paul says here in Romans chapter 9. First of all, we see that Paul makes the point that God chose Abraham and his descendants as a corporate group through which he would do four things. Now, we're looking at them as an entity, as a group, as a, as a, uh, a whole, not in terms of individual parts. And the first thing that God had promised Abraham that was through him all nations would be blessed, Genesis 12, 2. All nations would be blessed through the coming of the Savior, that is, the seed promised to Abraham. Also repeated in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, verse 16. Secondly, Paul points out in this chapter that Israel as a whole is the recipient of God's covenants and promises. God made a covenant with Abraham, but it was with Abraham and his descendants as a, as a 
as a group. God made a, a covenant with, with uh, Moses and with David, but it has to do with his, this corporate understanding of Israel as a, as a people. And third, we see the emphasis that the Messiah would enter the human race through Israel and come, and that he would come initially to Israel as a nation. And this is seen in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, as well as in the first chapter of John, that he comes to his own, but his own received him not in John uh, 1, 11. And then fourth, we learn from Romans chapter 9 that not all of Israel is true Israel. True Israel is not just those who are born genetically as descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but those who also follow Abraham in faith and trust in the promise of God in his promise of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to the fulfillment of the promise in the New Testament, and now in this age we look back and we believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So true Israel is a combination of two things. Genetic relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and a spiritual relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by trusting in the promise of God in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last time I also pointed out that when we come to a passage like this, as we come to understand things like context, we have to focus on not only the immediate context of Romans 9 to 11, and understanding this concept of corporate Israel, that God is dealing with them as a whole, as well as in terms of being uh, individuals. That means that Israel as a whole, as a nation, can trust God, but there may be individuals that are unsaved. Israel as a whole can reject Christ, but there will be individuals that trust in him and are justified. There are, the nation itself can be in apostasy, but individuals are following God, as we've seen in our study of Elijah. Or the nation as a whole can be serving God and yet have individuals within the nation that are apostate and idol worshipers. So this idea of corporate is not an idea that we're always that familiar with, that there can be discipline for the nation, but blessing for individuals. Can you think of an example in the Old Testament? The nation goes out under the fifth cycle of discipline in 586, and the nation is under judgment by God, under divine discipline, and yet you have tremendous blessing individually upon people like Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, and a number of others who individually are trusting God. So we not only look at the, uh, the immediate context, but we also have to look at a biblical context, which means that as we understand this particular verse, these two verses, they're surrounded by Old Testament references. To really understand uh, this, these two verses that at, at, at the surface looks like a, quote, salvation verse, and is often used that way in, in many Many churches, many denominations, you, you know, unless you come forward, walk the aisle, make a public profession of faith, and you just weren't saved. And what I'm showing you is that is just, it ignores the context, immediate context, ignores the context of Romans 9 to 11, ignores the context of Romans, and frankly, it ignores the context of the Bible. So we had to look at some background passages that are used and quoted in this, in this section, and there are, there are five, Deuteronomy 30. We must also understand Matthew 12, 24, 31 to 32. Even though that's not quoted in the passage, it provides important information for understanding it. Matthew 23, 39 as well provides that background information. Joel 2, 32 is quoted in uh, Romans 10, uh, 12. And then uh, fifth, we need to understand Romans 11, uh, 25. Once we get a grip on these passages... Then when we go back and we look at what is said in Romans 10, 9, and 10, we know what is being said. So we also have to look at some key words such as saved and salvation, confess and call, righteousness, and then we will look at how resurrection is used by the Apostle Paul 
theologically or doctrinally. Last time we looked at the first three verses leading into Romans 10, 9, and 10, Romans 10, 6 through 8. Romans 10, 6 through 8 loosely apply or paraphrase Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Now, we ought to remember the context of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And that's important in, to look at the first three verses of that chapter. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, we read, Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you. What are all these things? God has just told them that there will come a time in your history when you're so disobedient that I will remove you from the land. Leviticus 26 identified five different stages of divine discipline, where in each stage the discipline became a little harsher, a little more intense, and the most extreme form, what we refer to as the fifth cycle of discipline, was where God promised that they would get to a point where God would remove them from the land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they were so rebellious that he would uh, remove all blessing from them as a nation and take them out of the land. They would be defeated militarily and removed from the land. But God promises that one day, yet future even to our time, God would bring them back from the four corners of the earth and restore them to the land. And that's what Deuteronomy 30 is all about. Deuteronomy 30 verse 1 emphasizes that when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord God drives you. In the diaspora, that's a Greek word meaning dispersion, which has become a technical term for the scattering of Israel among the nations. Uh, in the diaspora, they will come to a point where they will remember God. This hasn't occurred yet. This will occur, we know, toward the end of the tribulation period. When um, you call the, to mind these things among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So when the Apostle Paul comes along and he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30 in these verses... 11 through 8, 14, that context has to do with their future return and restoration to the land as God's people in a position of blessing. So the focus here is on Israel, and the focus is on Israel as saved, not as needing to be saved, okay? He is addressing them in Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14, as a saved people and in terms of how they should live as a saved people. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses is telling the people that they cannot use as an excuse that they just can't find God. That, I, you know, God just is so distant. I can't find him. I can't really learn about him. If he would just do some miracle or if he would just appear to me, then, then, then I would believe in him. You hear people say that even today. Moses says that they can't use that as an excuse because God revealed himself to the nation at Mount Sinai and that God had given them the law, which was right there. Look at that last verse, verse 14 on the screen, lower right. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. In your what? In your mouth and in your heart. What's he going to say in Romans 10 if you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth? Remember that. It's important to understand that Old Testament context because that's exactly how Paul is going to apply this uh, in Romans 10, 9, and 10. The word is very near you. What he is saying is that God has made it very clear to you. You have all of this revelation right there next to you. You can't say, I don't know where God is. You're left without excuse. 
Paul applies that to the people of his day in the first century by showing that they can't use that excuse either. They can't say, well, we just can't find out about God. We don't know where he is. If we could get to heaven, maybe we could find him. Or if we could go down into the pit, maybe we could find him. But, but we can't find God. And so Paul is taking that verse out of Deuteronomy, those verses out of Deuteronomy 30 and applying them to his time, and he is saying, he is saying that uh, Jesus has come down from heaven, and he has been raised from the dead, so that you are without excuse. You can't say or can't find him. He has come to us, and he has revealed himself to us. Furthermore, we've seen that in Romans 10, verse 5, that there is a quotation from Leviticus 18.5. And in that passage, it's dealing with how a redeemed people are to live, not how they become redeemed. So the point that I am making, just so you get this clear, is that neither of these Old Testament passages that lead into Romans 10.9 and 10 are talking about how to be redeemed, how to be justified, how to be regenerated. They're talking about how the redeemed person lives after he's redeemed, how the justified person lives after he's justified, and how the regenerate person is to live after he is regenerate. And then he's going to apply this to Israel. That's the context of Romans 9, 10, and 11. He starts off in verse 9 by saying that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from what? In order to answer that question, we have to go to another passage for background. And this is in Matthew chapter 12. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 is a pivotal chapter in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 12 is a pivotal event in Christ's ministry because he came to Israel to offer the kingdom to Israel. He offered, came to Israel as the Messiah to present himself as the promised Savior, promised as the, the one who was born of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 9 he is the one who is Emmanuel. He is come in fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies. And so Jesus came, he offered the kingdom to Israel as a nation, but they rejected it as a nation. While many individuals believed in him, individual Jews like the disciples, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, like Nicodemus, like Joseph of Arimathea, Though many individuals believed he was the promised Messiah and trusted in him, the nation as a whole, the majority did not, and the leadership did not. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, as, a, as, the, as the representative body of leaders, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. As a result, the nation was condemned to punishment, divine discipline, under the fifth cycle of discipline. This is a corporate punishment. Their removal as a nation in, 70, in AD 70 was a national discipline, even though there were many individuals who were saved. This is parallel to what happened in the Old Testament in 722 B.C. and in 586 B.C. There were individuals in the northern kingdom of Israel as well as in the southern kingdom of Judah, who were believers who were obedient to God. Nevertheless, it was necessary for God to discipline the nations as a whole because the nation as a whole, its leaders, its people, were in rebellion against him and in idolatry. As I pointed out, Leviticus 26, God outlines these five successive stages of divine discipline that he would bring upon the nation of Israel if they succumbed to idolatry. You can read about these in Leviticus uh, chapter 26, verses 27 to 33, where we have the last and final stage, which is the removal of the people of Israel, the corporate nation, from the land. Now, there were a few that were left. See, I'm making that distinction between individuals and corporate. As a nation, they are removed from the land. In 722, the northern kingdom went out under divine discipline, in 586 
the southern kingdom went out under divine discipline. But around 536 B.C., God is going to bring them back into the land. And they come back under the leadership of Zerubbabel, who was a descendant of David, and about 50,000 returned with him from Babylon, Babylon, which is what we refer to as the Babylonian captivity. Uh, over the next century or two, many other Jews would return to the land, but at no point up to the time of Jesus were there more than 50% of all the Jews in the world living in the land. Only a small percentage, maybe 35 45% lived in the land. But there had to be a community of Jews, a nation of Jews in the land for the Messiah to come to and to present himself to. And it was that corporate group who would make the decision that would affect, that would affect the whole. Now we have an interesting parallel in the Old Testament in uh, passages such as 2 Kings chapter 23 and Ezekiel chapter 14, which indicate that the nation could reach a point of no return. In other words, you reach this point, the discipline is going to come into effect, the fifth cycle of discipline is going to come into effect, and you'll be taken out of the land even if you turn to God before that, even if there is, there is just a point of sort of cumulative consequences that, it will, uh, that could occur because of continuous sin, that God is going to have to bring about the fifth cycle of discipline no matter what. I think the same thing can be true in our own lives, that God may in grace look overlook sin in our life to a certain point, and then if there is no uh, change or growth, then God is going to bring about the discipline necessary in order to get our, to get our attention. But we see an example of this in 2 Kings Chapter 23, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse uh, 24. 2 Kings 23, uh, 24. There we read, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists. Josiah was a good king. He had instituted a tremendous spiritual revival in the nation, He was uh, the son of Manasseh, who was the most wicked, evil king the northern kingdom had. But he was so evil that, and the nation was so apostate, and had been so apostate for so long, that no matter how spiritual they became under Josiah, uh, the die was cast. God was going to take them out under divine discipline. And so we read, moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the works of the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the law. See, for decades, the word of God was lost completely. They had no copy. Nobody even knew what it said. It was buried somewhere in a storage room in the temple until they cleaned out the temple and found it. In verse 25, we're told, Now before him, that is, before Josiah, there was no king like him. He, next to David, he's the greatest, most spiritual king Israel had. There was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. Then verse 26, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, with which his anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. In other words, they were so apostate and so rebellious under Manasseh that divine discipline was necessary, and no matter what changes occurred, the cancer of carnality had grown to such an extent that major surgery was still necessary. And so the nation was set to go out under under divine discipline. In verse 27, the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel, the northern kingdom, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house which I said, my name shall be there. So that sets a precedent that the nation can be still will still go out under the fifth cycle of discipline, even though you have a large number of spiritually mature positive believers within the nation. 
Now, we're going to take that as a pattern, and we're going to go to the context of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 is a passage that many people raise questions on, having to do with the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. Now, it's important to understand what we mean here when we talk about the unpardonable or unforgivable sin, and we will get to that, but first we need to understand some things about the context in Matthew chapter 12. This chapter brings the confrontations between Jesus between Jesus and the Pharisees to a head as he has continued to teach and as he has continued to correctly, of course, interpret the law of Moses, it has challenged the teaching of the Pharisees. It's challenged their legalism. It has challenged their whole traditional setup, and it has challenged their authority over the people. And it comes to a head in this chapter. The first thing that happens is uh, Jesus is walking with his disciples. They go through a field Uh, where the wheat has grown, and they begin to pull off grains of wheat to eat and to snack on, and it is on the Sabbath. And according to Pharisaical tradition, that violated the Sabbath law. It did not violate what the Mosaic law said. It only violated their, uh, their tradition. And so they confront Jesus and challenge him. Then in verses 9 through 14, there's another conflict because Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And so this intensifies that particular conflict. And then in verse 14 we read, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted or conspired against him how they might destroy him. Luke tells us that they were filled with rage. And they're going to set out their plan to destroy Jesus. This is the beginning of the end, we might say. This is the great turning point. Jesus has offered the kingdom to the nation, and now we're going to see that the nation rejects it. In verse 6, we're, in verse 15, rather, uh, it, we're told that Jesus continues to heal. Great multitudes follow, follow him. He heals them all, but he warned them not to make him known. Don't go tell the Pharisees. And then there's a quote from the Old Testament, beginning in verse 18. Uh, verse 18 from Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, which puts the emphasis on the role that God the Holy Spirit played in empowering Jesus in his ministry as the Messiah and in his healing. Now that leads up to another miracle. In verse 22, he is going to cast out a demon. We're told in verse 22, then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Now, why is it important that we're told that he is blind and mute? It is because the procedure that the rabbis used, that the Jews used for casting out a demon, was that they would enter into a conversation with the demon, ask the demon what his name was, and then use the name to cast out a demon. Jesus follows that procedure with the Gadarene demoniac. But here, he's not. You know why not? If you ask a mute demon what his name is, he can't tell you because he's mute. And so the rabbis had a tradition, the Jews had a tradition that when the Messiah came, he would cast out a mute demon. See, the rabbis couldn't do that. This is a unique messianic sign that the Messiah would cast out a mute demon because he can't ask him what his name is. He's just going to cast out the demon, and so he does. And the blind and mute demon both spake and saw. And so look at the response by the multitude in verse 23. They're amazed and they say, can this be the son of David? See there, is this the Messiah? This is a, nobody's ever done this before. Is this the Messiah? Now when the Pharisees heard this in verse 24, they said, well first, they think. If we say he's the Messiah, we're We're toast. So we can't validate his claims. The only alternative is that he did this by the devil. So that's what they say. So this fellow doesn't cast out demons except by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided by itself is brought to desolation. Okay, we're just going to stop there. What has happened is they're saying that instead of doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
And the role of the Holy Spirit was to give the confirmatory evidence of who Jesus was as the Messiah, that because he didn't do it, they're saying he didn't do it by the Spirit, he did it in the power of the devil. That's why it's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and not against the Son of God. So after Jesus talks to them in verses 25 to 30, he's then going to make his point in verse uh, 31 and following. And that's what I want you to focus on here in the next slide. Matthew 28, he said, or 12, 28, he said, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I've been doing this by the Spirit of God, then that confirms that I'm the Messiah and that my offer of the kingdom is legitimate. But then he said in verse 31, which I don't have on the slide, he says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone, and then he defines what that is, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, what does he mean when he says, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man? Well, we didn't take time, but if you go back and look at the first eight verses where Jesus was taking his disciples through the grain field, the last verse, verse 8, says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's the point he makes. He identifies himself there as the Son of Man. Did the Pharisees challenge him there? Yes, they're challenging his him and his identity as the Son of Man. And Jesus says, you know, you can speak a word against the Son of Man, and it's not the de- determinative sin. That will be forgiven you. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, when the nation gets to that point where their leaders reject completely the evidence of the Holy Spirit and say it's not the Holy Spirit, not the Spirit of God, it is, it's the devil, that is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and it won't be forgiven him. Now the question is, what kind of forgiveness is this? Well, as you know, we've identified four different kinds of forgive, forgiveness in Scripture, judicial forgiveness, our positional forgiveness in Christ, our experiential forgiveness in time, and fourth, the forgiveness that we have relationally one to another. This is the third kind of forgiveness. This isn't, he's not talking about this is unforgivable in the sense that this is a sin that I can't pay for, or this is a sin I won't pay for. He is saying that this This is the same kind of sin that the Jews had in the Old Testament. This cuts it. You're going out under divine discipline because you've rejected me as the Messiah. It's not talking about the fact that you can't be justified and get into heaven now because you you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. He is saying, by rejecting me, this has finally come to a head. This is it. This is the final spot. You have rejected me and my offer of the kingdom, and so I'm withdrawing it. From this point on, I will not go to Israel. I will go, I'm going to start teaching about the uh, the church. That's what happens in Matthew 13. From this point on, I'm not going to offer you the kingdom anymore. It's never offered again. From this point on, the focus is on going to the cross, not bringing in the kingdom. There's a shift that occurs here. This is that great national sin that Israel committed. And so in verse, let's go to the next, not that slide, there we go. Uh, In in these verses, uh, verse 32, it also says, it won't be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. This age was the age of the Messiah, his age, that time at the end of the age of Israel. The age to come is the church age. Neither of those ages is related to the final age, which is the millennial kingdom. And so what he is saying there is that this national sin is not going to be remitted. The the consequences in time are not going to be removed from the nation until the in, after the end of the next age. So let me summarize this. First of all, Jesus announce, announces now that this is a judgment of divine discipline on the nation of his time. 
we have to realize that only that generation could commit the unforgivable sin, that is, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Only that nation at that time in history. You can't do it. I can't do it. A, we're not Jewish. B, we don't live in the early part of the first century. And C, we're not part of the leadership of Israel. We just can't do it. It doesn't apply to anybody today. Period. There's no such thing as an unforgivable sin. People say, oh, what about the sin of unbelief? Jesus paid for it at the cross. He died for the sin of unbelief at the cross. He died for every sin of the cross. But guess what? Just because Jesus paid the penalty for sin on the cross doesn't mean you're saved. He pays the objective penalty toward God, but that doesn't mean that you're not spiritually dead and you're not unrighteous. Remember, I've always taught there's three things that you have to have to get into heaven. Number one, the sin penalty God assigned to sin has to be paid for. That's handled by Christ on the cross. That is handled by the doctrines of propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption. That is when the sin penalty is officially paid for in propitiation. But just because the Father is propitiated, just because the price is paid, doesn't mean that we're automatically born again that we're automatically regenerate or we're automatically justified. See, the first problem is the sin penalty. The second problem is we're born spiritually dead. And the third problem is we're unrighteous. Just because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin on the cross doesn't automatically make you spiritually alive or give you righteousness. When you trust Christ as your Savior, at that instant, God imputes to you the perfect righteousness of Christ, declares you to be justified, and you become born again. He paid the penalty for the sin penalty for unbelief. But he paid the sin penalty for everything, but just because he paid the penalty doesn't automatically make anybody justified or regenerate. You have to believe. And so the unforgivable sin is a unique sin in history related to Israel and their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. It wasn't an individual sin, it was a corporate sin. No other generation or person could commit that particular sin. So Jesus announced this judgment, and that judgment came in A.D. 70 when the Roman army took the nation out under divine discipline. They're still under divine discipline. But Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that they will have a future deliverance, not justification. Notice he uses the word saved again, a future deliverance. We looked at this verse last time. He says, and so in this manner... That's the idea of the Greek there. All Israel will be saved. When does this occur? When the deliverer comes out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, taking away their sins doesn't refer to paying the penalty for the sins, because that happened at the cross. This is when the temporal discipline is removed from the nation. They're under the fifth cycle of discipline from 70 until just before Jesus returns. And what happens just before Jesus returns? Joel 2.32, this is the verse that's quoted in Romans chapter 10, two verses after verse 10. Joel says, it shall come to pass, when? At the day of the Lord, during the tribulation period, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the intense heat of the Armageddon campaign, the Jews have fled to the hills. They have gone, as we've studied in, on Tuesday night, to the desert, the hills around Petra. And there they will come together as a group of individually justified Jewish believers. They will come together as a group and corporately They will call upon the name of the Lord, which is an idiom for not only calling for personal deliverance, but it's also used in the Old Testament of corporate worship. There they will call upon the name of the Lord. They will call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to come and physically deliver them. This is what these words mean in the Hebrew. The word for saved is the word melet, meaning physical deliverance from an attack. And the word, uh, when it says in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, this is the word palita, meaning escape from physical danger. A couple of days before Jesus went to the cross, Matthew twenty-three thirty-nine, he said, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me 
until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They don't say that until the end of the tribulation period. And when they do, Jesus Christ will return. And he will give them victory over the armies of the Antichrist. He will physically deliver them. And he will then lead them on a march of triumph back to Jerusalem. We'll look at that next time. The point that we need to understand this morning is the significance that Matthew 12 plays in understanding that Israel was set to go out under divine discipline. And what Paul is saying in Romans 10, 9, and 10 is directly related to Israel. That confession with the mouth is parallel to calling on the name of the Lord. And if you confess with your mouth corporately as a nation, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God... That's what Lord usually means is God. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, that's what they had rejected. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is God and believe that God raised him from the dead, they had rejected the resurrection. Believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What kind of salvation? The physical deliverance of Israel, of the remnant there at the end of the tribulation. So next time, We'll wrap it up, looking at those verses and putting them all together in context, and we'll see that this verse has nothing to do with getting into heaven, but it has to do with the Jews finally, as a nation, turning to God and realizing, being able to realize all of the blessings and promises that God uh, gave to them, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, provided for us, for your word that gives us such clarity. Father, we pray that as we study your word that we would come to just a tremendous understanding of your grace, your goodness to us, all that you've given us, and especially all the dimensions of our own personal salvation, that we're justified, we're regenerate, simply because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. There he paid our penalty in our behalf, and so we can just simply trust in him, and we have salvation. We pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's with that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that sure and certain. And you can have eternal life simply by believing Jesus died on the cross for your sins and trusting in him alone. God gives you eternal life. He justifies you, regenerates you, and you have eternal life. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge us with what we studied this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.